Hi everyone, my name's Lucia and today I'm going to be talking to you about polyneuropathies and this presentation will be aimed at medical students. So a polyneuropathy is a disorder where there's damage to multiple peripheral nerves and there are a wide variety of causes of polyneuropathies and so it can be helpful to split these up into different categories as shown in this table. And I've highlighted diabetes, alcohol and vitamin deficiencies as these are generally the most common cause of polyneuropathies seen in the developed world. So you have the metabolic causes, which include diabetes and hypothyroidism, toxins, including alcohol, drugs, especially many chemotherapy agents, and heavy metals such as lead. Then there are the vitamin deficiencies, which tie in with alcohol, as that often comes in hand with vitamin B deficiency. Inflammatory causes, including Guillain-Barre syndrome, infectious causes, Hereditary, such as charcot marie tooth and finally neoplastic processes can also cause polyneuropathy. So how do patients with a polyneuropathy present? As a polyneuropathy is a disorder of the peripheral nerves, the symptoms can be grouped into those arising from damage to the sensory, motor and autonomic nerves. Starting with sensory symptoms, these can include sensory loss in any of the modalities, which usually starts distally, and I will talk more about the particular pattern of sensory loss typically seen in chronic polyneuropathies, such as that caused by diabetes, on the next slide. Other common symptoms include poor balance, loss of dexterity, and numbness in the feet. Paresthesia, so pins and needles and tingling sensations, and neuropathic pain, such as burning sensations, can also be a feature that patients complain of. In terms of motor symptoms, remember that polyneuropathy affects the peripheral nerves, so there will be lower motor neuron signs. These can include hyporeflexia, muscle weakness, muscle wasting and fasciculations. And finally, autonomic symptoms. As our autonomic nervous system innervates many different organs, these symptoms can be wide and varied, including orthostatic hypotension, problems with sweating, erectile dysfunction, and gastric paresis, leading to feelings of early satiety and bloating. And then in later stages, patients may present with the consequences of damage to these different nerves. So you may see skin changes and foot ulcers can develop due to loss of sensation distally. So-called Charcot or neuropathic joints can develop in later stages of polyneuropathy, where loss of sensation in the joint can lead to progressive joint damage and destruction over time, and I've included a photo of this here. One way of classifying polyneuropathies is by the type of nerve affected, so sensory, motor or autonomic. But in later stages, there can be a combination of one or more of these, with one predominating. So you may have heard of terms such as a predominantly sensory or a predominantly motor polyneuropathy. Another way to think about polyneuropathies is about the underlying process of nerve damage and whether it is primarily due to axonal degeneration or demyelination. And I will talk about axonal degeneration first, as this is more common and gives rise to the chronic polyneuropathies, such as diabetic polyneuropathy. So these usually develop over months to years and sensory symptoms predominate in the early stages of disease. So they produce a symmetric length dependent polyneuropathy and this means that it affects both sides of the body and they are termed length dependent as the longest nerves are affected first. So those that supply the distal extremities, the feet, and then gradually the sensory loss progresses. And when it reaches the level of about the knees being affected, then the hands will start to be affected too. This is demonstrated nicely in this diagram and the distribution of sensory loss is what you have probably heard of before as the glove and stocking distribution. And this is classically how diabetic polyneuropathy will present. Note that proprioception is relatively intact compared to the other sensory modalities and is only affected later. So that if there is early proprioceptive loss, such as gait ataxia, then you need to think about dorsal column disease, for instance, from B12 deficiency. So I've spoken about the typical sensory presentation, but with disease progression, motor symptoms will start to develop distally as well, often beginning with reduced reflexes and then muscle weakness. 
and examples of this sort of chronic symmetric polyneuropathy, diabetes, alcohol and vitamin deficiencies. Now, moving on to those polyneuropathies where demyelination is the main underlying process, these are less common than the chronic axonal polyneuropathies I just spoke about. And firstly, I want to talk about Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS, which in its most common form is an acute demyelinating polyneuropathy. It typically develops within a couple of weeks following a GI or respiratory infection, and a number of organisms have been implicated, one of them being Campylobacter jejuni. And in contrast to the polyneuropathies we just spoke about, where sensory symptoms predominate early on, GBS is a predominantly motor polyneuropathy at onset, and patients often present with weakness. Again, this usually starts distally and then progresses and ascends, reaching maximum intensity around two weeks after symptom onset. Patients can also present with sensory symptoms and may even have autonomic dysfunction, so they can have labile blood pressure or heart rate fluctuations. I specifically mention GBS here as it is a medical emergency because in some cases it can lead to respiratory failure if the weakness ascends and affects the muscles involved in respiration. There are also some chronic demyelinating polyneuropathies such as CIDP or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy and Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease Type 1, one of the hereditary causes of polyneuropathy. Type 1 is the most common variation of Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease and onset is usually in childhood. And I've put some images here of the typical clinical picture of Charcot-Marie Tooth as you may see some of these patients in your clinical rotations or clinical examinations. So there is muscle weakness and wasting in the feet and lower limbs, and this distal pattern of wasting gives rise to what is sometimes described as inverted champagne bottle legs, and foot drop and foot deformities are common, such as a high arch and hammer toes. Moving now onto the investigations. So this is really going to be guided by your history and examination, and hopefully after those, you already have an idea of what the cause may be. But initial blood tests in all patients presenting with a polyneuropathy generally include these. So a full blood count, user knees and ESR, CRP, glucose, HbA1c, liver function and thyroid function, a B12 and folate and serum electrophoresis. And then, depending on the clinical picture and your suspicions, other tests may be indicated such as nerve conduction studies, a lumbar puncture, which can be useful, for instance, in the case of GBS, where it may display raised protein levels, or more specific blood tests, for instance, looking for particular antibodies against an infective organism, and a skin or nerve biopsy. And I just wanted to particularly mention nerve conduction studies here, as they can be very useful in distinguishing predominantly axonal pathologies from the predominantly demyelinating ones. As I'm sure you'll remember, the myelin sheath insulates the axon, allowing for faster propagation of electrical signals, and so the demyelinating pathologies will show a reduced conduction velocity. And finally, how do we manage a patient with polyneuropathy? So there's a few basic principles of management for all of those chronic symmetrical polyneuropathies we spoke about. First of all, you have to treat the underlying cause whether that be controlling blood glucose levels in diabetes, or eliminating any toxic agents, such as alcohol, or stopping a particular medication, or replacing vitamins in vitamin deficiency. And secondly, we need to manage any symptoms that the patient has. So for any neuropathic pain, amitriptyline, duloxetine, gabapentin, or pregabalin are all recommended as appropriate therapies by the NICE guidelines. Foot care and appropriate footwear is very important, and depending on the disease severity, patients may also benefit from physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Then we also need to prevent the complications of polyneuropathy, such as those foot ulcers I spoke about before. And this is why it is so important for diabetics to attend their annual foot clinic, so we can assess for any signs of polyneuropathy developing. Regular assessment is crucial, because many patients do not complain of any particular symptoms, but do have signs of polyneuropathy on clinical examination. 
patients therefore should be educated about polyneuropathy themselves so we can teach them to be aware of the signs and symptoms to look out for and encourage self-inspection of their own feet. Of course, as with anything, prevention is better than management. And I really wanted to emphasize that here. So in terms of diabetes, we should work with our patients to encourage them to have a good blood glucose control from the start of their disease to reduce their chance of developing polyneuropathy in the first place. So those management strategies I just outlined were more for the chronic polyneuropathies. But in the case of GBS, there is a more specific treatment in the form of intravenous immunoglobulin. Then the other aspects of the management are more supportive and include things such as DVT prophylaxis, as these patients can be extremely weak and immobile, and ventilation may be required if the weakness begins to affect the respiratory muscles. So to summarise, there are the chronic symmetrical polyneuropathies, of which the most common causes include diabetes, alcohol and the vitamin deficiencies. And these present as a length dependent polyneuropathy with predominantly sensory symptoms at onset. And the principles of management are to treat the underlying cause if possible, manage any symptoms that the patient may have and to prevent any complications. And then there is GBS, which is an acute symmetrical polyneuropathy. It is predominantly motor and presents as an acute paralysis with severe generalised weakness. And the treatment for this is more specific and is intravenous immunoglobulin. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation and I hope you all found it helpful. And finally, I've just listed some resources here, which you can have a look at if you'd like to find out a little bit more about the topic. So the first two are some websites which provide a good general overview, and the third one is a review. And then at the bottom, I've linked a video on how to perform a diabetic foot examination, as I think it's really important that we're all aware of this so we can screen for any presence of polyneuropathy in diabetic patients. And this is good because you can then take this into your studies when on the wards or in clinics and practice this for yourself on patients. And here are the references I use to make this presentation, as well as the references for any images or diagrams.